How do you function without Fufu? Good. Uh, great. Um, I need to adapt, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I need to. Yeah, I need to adapt to different foods because obviously you travel around and uh, you don't get your fufu. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna say no. Um, I want to leave now. Welcome everybody to the official Thomas Hassal show, driven by Continental, the official Thomas Hassal show of MLSsoccer.com. You can find us on YouTube for the full viewing experience. If you are listening on a podcast, if you're watching on YouTube. Boom, you're doing the right thing. You can also find us on all your podcast platforms. My partners in soccer today, I am Thomas Asal, joined by Thomas Asal in Cape Cod, and Thomas Asal, of course, in Long Island City. We will have Jonathan Mensa coming up later this show to ask him about Thomas Asal and break <laughs> it all down. This is the MLS show you guys all wanted. I am still jacked up, even though Vancouver lost. I got the Vancouver jersey behind me. I've had it up for two months. Now I can wear it with pride. Let's go. You guys have to be happy right now. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. It was a it was a, a long, late, very MLS evening. Um, Thomas Asal, who looks like a 14-year-old paper boy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> was immense in goal for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like this is a league of chaos in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, this summer and this tournament has provided some of the, the very best aspects of that. Uh, and it was a spectacular performance. And this is how legends begin. I, I guess I'll just second that as Thomas Asal showing that he's ready to step up. We saw Crapo make unbelievable saves last year. And I don't know what they're doing. The goalkeeper coach must be on <laughs> top of things because these keepers – if you have to rely on them to stay in games, it's it's also troubling. But uh, Charlie, everyone likes touches. So if you're a goalkeeper <laughs> who averages 22 to 33 shots against, you're having a good game. You're in the flow of the game. Yeah. You're feeling good. That's one, that's one way to look at it. That's definitely one way Boom. to look at it. That's how you breathe. You've got the next generation of Canadian hey, those, goalkeepers. Those are, hey, those are the teams I love to play against. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie would be camped that. out on the six, <laughs> ripping pot shots. At hey. a paper boy. It I was mean, that, epic. That's basically what happened last night. Like the caps were defending in his lap for the entire 90 minutes. They gave up 36 shots. They got out shot 36 to eight. And you're like, wow, that's a lot. But then you look and that's what happened to them in the group stage as well. Like they, over the course of this tournament, I think they got outshot something like 110 to 27. Uh, this is what the job is. If you're going to be the, the goalkeeper for Vancouver, it was like this should have ended two or three nil and oh, a big, you know, a tip of the cap to, to Thomas Asal because he made some really wonderful saves. Uh, I think if you're sporting KC's attackers, probably frustrated with yourselves, probably looking at your goal bonus and thinking, damn, I left some money on the table. Um, but like this game played out almost exactly how you would expect a tournament game to play out in these circumstances where one team is so much better, so much uh, more favored than the other. But you also need another team to come and dance. And you had Derek Cornelius throwing in blocks left and right. I think Russell Tybert would have still been running if they let him. He was, like, not ready for PKs. He's like, let's play 30, 40, 50 more minutes. Uh, and we'll talk about this, go, you know, coming up. Uh, Mark Dos Santos had some positive things to say coming out of it. But I think uh, Andrew Weeby in our preview show asked, what does Vancouver need to see this year? And it was anything positive or culture. And this is only four games in a tournament, a weird scenario, but you know everyone in the Vancouver fan base feels right now what they were looking for from 2020. Now the hope is they get to play more games and they can do it with like maybe the 11 other players on their roster that weren't in Orlando, which they keep mentioning fairly, but now they have to play better when they get those guys. We are actually getting Jonathan Mensa on the show. That was real. I wasn't joking about that. We probably won't ask him about Thomas Asal as much, uh, but we have a lot to ask him about. And yes, uh, I think... Was it uh, was it the Charleston Battery that had a coaching change? Someone down south changed coaches recently, and I don't I don't quite remember who. But uh, we'll talk about that coming up. We've got names for you. We've got ideas. What does Atlanta United have to do going forward? What are the possibilities for them? Let's start off with a couple pieces of news: uh, zero COVID nineteen tests once again coming out of the last round of testing, and the MLS is back bubble in Orlando. So that's great news to hear. 
and the Houston Dash have won the NWSL Challenge Cup, the first team sport league to come back in the United States. Their tournament finishing at Rio Tinto Stadium. Rachel Daly dominating and winning the championship. Why? Because that's my homie. Let's go, Rachel Daly. I called her first two ever soccer games on this continent, and she scored like 19 goals in those two games, and she continues to score 19 goals against everyone. So that was fun to watch. Congratulations to them. Uh, congratulations to everyone, I think, involved with the NWSL. Fantastic tournament, quality soccer. Everyone was safe. Great coverage of it, and we hope to continue to see that going forward in 2020 and 2021. If you enjoy it, go find coverage of it. Show people that you care and that you want to talk about it. Uh, one thing to throw out there, if you uh, haven't heard about this story, Jaime Moreno had a golfing accident and potentially has lost vision in his left eye. He is uninsured right now, so the Barra Brava are putting together a GoFundMe. Last time I checked, it has already raised $45,000 for potential surgical needs for him. We talked about him a lot when we did the Mount Rushmore's in this league. He has been in this league. He has been in the D.C. area for his entire career. He loves it. He's done so much good for so many people. Now an opportunity for us to do a little good for him. So you could just search his name and you'll see the stories that have been written by Stephen Goff and Pablo Mauer and other people in that area that will link you to the GoFundMe page. Let's get back to MLS is back. You can watch MLS today coming up tonight before and after every single knockout game going forward. So the games are all night games. No more 9 a.m. games. I know Charlie's really upset about that. I but am. We're going to keep Doyle up as long as humanly possible because I think there's a chance that if we do this long enough, we could have an ETR that Doyle doesn't even remember. And if we get a blackout <laughs> Doyle ETR on exhaustion, who knows what goes on? <laughs> That's the goal. That right there. Tom, Tom Thibodeau, I'm going to play him every minute and see what I can get out of him at the end of this. Just call me Jimmy Buckets. Just call me Jimmy Buckets. And I cannot wait to see you blow up a practice. Ooh, <laughs> it's going to be good. Uh, Doyle said it. Vancouver, 11 p.m. Eastern time start, local start. 11 guys down, a 21-year-old goalkeeper. No backup goalkeeper in the game, in a bubble during a global pandemic. I think Felipe they were is throw. subbing Josie on Twitter during the game. Ali Adnan stopping a cameraman. They were going to throw Anders in goal. If, if Hassal had to come out and say it, it was – Producing Anders was going to have to, you know, get rid of all his Sounders gear, throw on some a Caps kit, and hop in goal. I was ready for that at that point. I would assume Anders purposely trying to be bad for Vancouver would actually be better than Anders trying to be good for Seattle. So I <laughs> oh, <laughs> have a decent chance. Uh, Doyle mentioned it, but XG, 3.21 to KC, 0.33 for Vancouver, but Doyle was fun. I love these games where one team pours it on, the other team's scrambling, and it starts to reach a point where the other team's just not going to score, no matter what they do. And it kind of got there pretty quickly in this game. Hassal makes like the one off Johnny Russell, where Russell didn't even see it coming, and then Hassal makes the save. Yep. It was just like energy. It was it was intense. It was one of those moments where everyone's watching, everyone's making jokes, everyone's texting about it, but it was awesome to watch. It, it was. And I, like after that first 15 minutes, which was like just a, a complete barrage from Sporting Kansas City and it was still nil nil. And you're like, oh, man, something something special and something potentially very memorable is, is happening right here. Um, and it got to the point where I think with 15 minutes left to go, I, I tweeted. I was like, this is Sporting Kansas City is really going to really going to lose this one in, in penalties because like. Vancouver had no business being in that game. They barely went forward. I think they had like maybe two moments. One was a deflected shot. Um, they, you know, played their left back at left midfield. They used three, you know, three defensive midfielders. They like they didn't start Jordy Raynan, who's their best attacker. It was like this is very clearly aiming towards either like a late what they did against the fire, just a couple of counterattacks, or penalties. Um, and of course, it ended up in penalties. And then that is where we forgot. Like I was tweeting during the game, I forgot it's Tim Melia. Tim Melia is literally by the numbers the best penalty stopper in MLS history. He stopped something around forty percent of all the penalties he's faced in regular play. He is now five and zero in penalty shootouts. That includes huge runs in the twenty fifteen and, and twenty seventeen uh, uh, U.S. Open Cups, and it, like, he made it look like child's play when it came time to to go up against those cats well, don't, 
Don't disrespect Nick Romano. That's all I'm going to say. It's not disrespecting Nick Romano, but by the numbers. Numbers, and by, man. The, and by the trophies, it's actually Tim Melia who, who has been better over the course of his career. Numbers are numbers. Sorry, Charlie. Stats these facts, don't lie. These facts don't care about your feelings. That's all I'm gonna <laughs> say. Don't disrespect Nick, Nicky Romano. But so I talked about the Vancouver side. You got, you got to have some confidence. I think as a fan base, you would have enjoyed what you saw just from a pure, like the connection of the team, the will to try and stay in that game. Charlie, on the flip side for SKC, this is a team people picked to potentially win this thing. They were mm-hmm. almost out in the group stage mm-hmm. and they were almost out in the quarterfinals against the team that I'll say it again, was missing 11 players was last in MLS last year uh, and hadn't really had any games to get themselves together. And SKC poured on the chances, which is the opposite of what we've seen. They've scored but struggled defensively, and this was a little bit of a different mix. Well, SKC is is definitely trying to figure things out as they go. They they have attacking pieces, but we've always questioned their defensive players. Are they are they up for the challenge? Are they on the same page? Are they checking? Are they going? Are they putting on the right pressure? Are they making the right decisions? That's been the problem. That's been the the really, uh, of course, Vancouver is a team that's not going to really threaten you with breaking you down in combination play. They're a team that capitalizes on transitions, you know, the fast breaks and free kicks, set pieces. That's that's Vancouver. You have Anand who can strike strike a ball from distance. You get lucky here and there. You put teams away, and then you have a, a goalkeeper in Hassal that can stand on his head and and keep you in games, and ultimately. Have you win games? They beat Chicago Fire because of you have this rain delay, and then they came out. Jordi Reyna comes out. He's like a shot out of a cannon, scores a goal, creates a goal, and next thing you know, they're in the group stage. But this Vancouver side, we knew they they weren't talent they weren't talented enough to be uh, one of the teams that making it out of a group. But fortunately, they had a goalkeeper who was on fire, and they were able to capitalize on on their their opportunities. KC, on the other hand, is a team that's you have Alan Polito, great great as he is, and, and the, uh, uh, he made a smooth transition into the to the, to the team, but you still need more. Johnny Russell needs to be playing at a higher level. Uh, Alan Polito needs to be finishing his chances. He gets in front of goal. He has great touches. The awareness is there. He has all of those factors that make you a great striker, but you got to finish your chances. We saw what happened to the New England Revolution. You can, you can play well, but if you're not going to finish your chances, Gustavo Bo has – seven, eight shots on uh, shots on uh, on goal, but you're not putting the ball in the back of the net. You're not going to win games. And so for Sporting Kansas City, kind of like New York City, things haven't gone well, but you're still getting results. You're still, you're still making it to the next round. You got At some point, you got to turn it on. So hopefully, you know, in their next match, they're ready to go. I've, I've heard that they're just going to cancel actually... the next rounds because Thomas Asal's out. So <laughs> it's over. It's over. You're just really gonna beat this bit to death, aren't you? You're just gonna. Uh, I loved everything about that. It was no, it was it was fantastic, and it, it it does feel like he came out of nowhere, right? Because he was a third string keeper. But this is a kid who has been part of the Canadian youth national team setups. This is a kid who was part of the White Caps Academy in Saskatchewan. So the White Caps, um, because of the way the academy system works, they're able to set up satellite academies basically everywhere west of Ontario. And that's where this kid came from. It's actually how they found Alfonso Davies, right? He was a he was elsewhere in British Columbia. If I Edmonton, he was in Edmonton. Um, so this is you, you you get out of it what you put into it. And there is talent in Canada. There is talent in the United States. Um, and the Caps, to their credit, have built a system uh, that identifies it. And then when the time comes, they're not afraid to use it. And you, they reaped the reward last night, and hopefully long term. I can't believe this cat is biting me so much. Uh, hopefully long term w- with the kids' performance. Uh, but you know, as for sporting, if you look at the the their stay during this tournament, they were so fo- so much better than Minnesota United until Melia got sent off. Then they struggled in that second game without Melia. Then they were the only team on the field against RSL. And they were, frankly, the only team on the field in this one. So I, I'm actually pretty confident that they are who we thought they were. And that last night was just a little bit of that midsummer MLS magic 
I think this is an apex, you know, could win the title team. I think that's what we're seeing with the sporting team. Though I do have a question about the central defense, obviously, because they have looked uh, flimsy at times. And, like, nobody talked about this, but Graham Smith started last night. Uh, Matt no, I was about to say, you just said an apex team with Graham Smith starting at center back. I mean, Graham Smith's had some nice moments, right? He like, let's not, let's not dismiss him yet. There are a lot of good center backs who have developed later in this league. Um, but like, I think it's worth noting that Matt Beasler did not start a, a knockout round game for this sporting Kansas city team. And Peter Vermees over like over the 11 years or 12 years, he's been managing Matt Beasler now has periodically kind of like tried to bench him has periodically been like, okay, you're no longer a starter. And Beasler always sort of works his way back into the starting lineup. Um, it's weird to see this happening during a tournament, though maybe he just had a knock or maybe he decided it was just rest. But it's something to keep an eye on going into the quarterfinals, potentially beyond for Sporting KC. He didn't start the last two games. Uh, SKC moving on to play Philadelphia. That will be on Thursday night coming up, so the first uh, quarterfinal game. They will play Philly, which I didn't have next in the rundown, but I can do whatever I want because MLS is back, baby. So let's go straight there. Philadelphia Union knocking off New England 1-0 in their matchup. Charlie, you mentioned New England, a ton of shooting shot, shot opportunities in other games. Uh, what did you feel like? Because this was, we thought, the tightest game maybe coming into this round. How did you feel coming out of it? I felt that it was there for New England to take. Um, and – Full credit to Philadelphia Union. They're just grinding out results. They don't play the best football. They don't connect passes and switch fields and make it look pretty with combination play. They have Sergio Santos and Casper Shibilko up top, and they play the diamond. They play the diamond midfield with uh, Alejandro Bedoya uh, tucked in with uh, Montero, and then Aronson up top, who sometimes looks like a third striker because he pushes so high. And you try and create those mismatches. You'd pull center backs out of position. You'd make those inside, uh, outside backs tuck in, which allows the outside backs, Kai Wagner and Ray Gattis, to get forward, although Ray Gattis is more of a stay-at-home right back, even though he will venture up top, uh, up forward. Uh, but for me, New England Revolution, without Carlos Hill, mind you, because I think if Carlos Hill plays, they win that game, they had opportunities, and they're not – finishing the finished product is missing you bring in a dp strike a lot like adam buxa he's the, he's there to score goals to just finish not cr to create goals not to dribble players and make beat them 1v1 just to get in the box and finish a chance and a player like adam buxa you're only going to get one two three chances a game you got to finish your chances especially with carlos seal off the field you're not going to get many so when you do get the opportunity you got to finish and gustavo Bo was brought to, to fill in for Carlos Hill. So he's brought into the midfield, play a little bit higher, but you're taking him away from his golden spots. That's where he likes to be in, in advanced positions where he's around the goal. Now, if you drop him deep to create for everyone else, you're taking away your best goal scorer now. And so I think you saw the revolution getting to the final third and not having the answers because you're missing Carlos Hill and you're bringing people out of position. They started Tejon Buchanan, a young rookie, uh, second year player. Not enough experience. Looked a little bit raw. He he has shown flashes like, man, he can be dynamic and dangerous in Major League Soccer, but he's not ready yet. Um, so I think it's a missed opportunity for the Revolution. Doyle, did you see development from Bruce year one to this tournament? Or is that not fair to even look for? Yeah, I think it's not fair to even look for. Just because of everything that's happened in 2020 and tournament play, is so it, it's very different from regular season play. I would say... I've seen development in terms of New England's depth. They, they've drafted well. Like like Charlie said, Tejan Buchanan wasn't quite up to it um, the other the other day, but next, he has that under his belt now, and he has talent. And next time they call on him, maybe he's ready. Kessler has looked good. I think they're, so. Their central defense has um, has more depth. Central midfield is still an open question. I think Kellen Rowe has won a spot. I still think. The six is questionable. Brandon Buys' leap has been spectacular. He has yes. been, and he's still, you can see he's still learning the game. He'll still, he still got caught out for, um, you know, on the goal. He His reaction wasn't quick enough, but he had a spectacular tournament. Um, so I think in all, you have to be, I think you should be 
pretty happy with the performance if you're New England. Uh, you know, and on top of that, they have Matt Turner, who is just – he's been amazing. He has been amazing. Through 50 games, I think he's, like, maybe the best shot stopper in terms of consistency and then making the spectacular save. He is maybe the best that we have seen – through 50 games. Um, but on the other side, Andre Blake has been the MVP of this tournament. It's not Diego Rossi. It wouldn't be Io Akinola. It's not going to be, you know, Alan Polito. Through four games, Andre Blake is the MVP of this tournament because Philadelphia is not really creating anything. Um, they, are, they are sort of committed to this 4-4-2 diamond for the first hour or so. And Jim Curtin, I thought his press conference was very good in sort of like delineating why they use it and how it wears teams down and kind of opens them up for the final half hour, which is very similar to what they did last year. Um, but they're still giving up chances. And without Harris Mandunian in, who they have not been able to replace in terms of how he orchestrates the game, like last year, Philadelphia was one of the most beautiful teams in the league to watch. They used the ball. They broke you down. They went side to side. They hit the pockets. They broke lines with their passes, all that they're not, it's not quite there without them doing it. They haven't figured that out and they haven't been able to press their way to goals after goals. So it's put a lot of pressure on Andre Blake. And this is the best I've ever seen Andre Blake play. This is better than he was when he won MLS goalkeeper of the year. He saved them against NYCFC. He saved them against Orlando city. He saved them against Miami. Miami had better chances. And then he saved them again uh, against the revs. And it's like, okay, it's a tournament. You're riding a hot keeper. You can ride him pretty hot, pretty far when when he's going like this. I would definitely agree with you. Is he's a he's a front runner um, amongst the MVPs, but Darlington Nagby is the outright yeah. MVP of the tournament. Over right Charlie's now. dead body, yeah. you're Charlie, giving an MVP if, to a goalkeeper. Oh, in this. If, if he wins, <laughs> they play. Here, here you go. On, <laughs> they played. Here you go, Andre. They Blake. played Cincinnati. They played the Red Bulls, and they played Atlanta. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what it, let's see if you know. Let's see if Columbus are still the juggernaut after they play a couple of, uh, we'll say, better teams. Yes. And, and if Philly wins the tournament, here you go, Andre Blake. But until that time, <laughs> you give D Nags that MVP trophy. No way. Right no way. No way. Without not even the, not Nags. even the crew. He's not even the crew MVP. Who's the crew MVP? Zella Ryan. I thought I was going to say Jonathan Mensa. I was about to pimp no the interview. Chance. Let's go. No chance. Um, but So, Charlie, can I make you a little happier? Can you talk yeah. about this finish from Santos? We don't do this a lot because it's a podcast. We can't show the clip, whatever. But this is an awesome finish. And to Doyle's point, maybe the tax not so fluid yet, but they found match winners and they have one who can step up every game. It's not Zella Ryan every game, right? It's – Shabilko one game, it's Bedoya one game, and it's Santos. This was an awesome finish. It, it was a fantastic finish, and it came from a Gustavo Bo turnover. Next thing you know, Sergio Santos, who, who had made dangerous runs uh, throughout the night, gets onto it, takes a touch. I thought he, he took one touch too many, but then he banged it over yeah. Matt Turner's left shoulder to go far post, and he put like a little swerve to it to hit it side netting. And I thought, wow, that's a, actually a fantastic finish. And then he gets subbed, you know, literally yeah. scores a goal, celebration, well, substitute. The celebration, <laughs> hey, which was well thought out. Yeah, it was It was a little stiff. It was a little muscular. <laughs> <laughs> he had been in the gym before the match. But um, <laughs> to, to be honest, I, w I, was, I was surprised with that finish. Uh, fantastic finish in the run. And Aronson, I think a knock on him has been, you know, he's not as – impactful when when the game gets physical when the game gets rough you, you hit him you kick him he backs down he didn't back down but he didn't have the best of nights but he's constantly moving he's constantly trying to to move defenders out of the space and allowing Shabilko and Sergio Santos to get a little bit more um have a little bit more uh space and and opportunities to get on the ball I think he's going to be turn into something special Brent, uh, Brent Aronson because I've seen his growth from literally year one to, to now and, and his grasp of things and how to basically combine with his players, the, the runs he's making. And then uh, I think he just has a better touch. He looks more confident on the ball. I do think he's going to be leaving MLS um, in, in 
after that after the season, possibly maybe next summer because of coronavirus and everything. And Matt Turner is another player I, who I expect to leave. I know teams are already interested in him, and having a European passport now makes you a little bit more attractive. So uh, Matt Turner and, and Brandon Aronson are two players that I think are definitely bound uh, for Europe in the next uh, six months. Doesn't need a European passport to be more attractive. That was a good looking man, but does make him easier to get in to professional <laughs> soccer team. Brendan Aronson, the rumors coming out of this game. Uh, I think Taylor Twelman, a few Bundesliga teams, a Belgian side, Celtic, who have also been linked to Mark McKenzie. And how often have we seen a club, especially like Celtic, find maybe a pipeline and just continue to use it? Uh, I thought they brought in a couple of Hondurans. They've done it in the Middle East, whatever. So we'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully, Brendan Aronson wins a trophy before that and then can hand Andre Blake an MVP uh, alongside <laughs> that. So fingers crossed for Philly. Let's get into the next one, though. Orlando knocked off Montreal 1-0. Mm-hmm. Uh, Orlando flying high now, four straight wins. And, um, you know, there's now debate how good they were last year and what the pieces were and what Oscar Preas brought. I thought this quote from Tesha Akindeli, though, was interesting. And this is a guy who played for Preha before, so knows him. And he said, people ask me this a lot, what's gone better? I keep saying the same thing, it's intensity. Uh, Tesho said, Oscar just brings a different level of intensity than most coaches. The level of practice is higher. The standards that are expected of us in the game are higher. Even off the field, these guys are watching video 24-7. They have everything prepared. They have a plan B prepared. uh, And that mindset is infectious. And I think, Doyle, to a level of like, maybe it got stale in Dallas, but this is who Oscar Pereja is. Maybe it got stale for him in that Maybe he stopped working for the details. Maybe it wasn't 24-7 for him if it got a little more turnkey. And now he comes into a new club, a fresh program, and he's the guy we know, which is he can get a group together and he can get them to be better than what they are. And to contextualize his stint in Dallas, he was there for five years. And that's a, that's a long time to keep it fresh in any managerial job in the world. You don't see a lot of that overseas. I, th- I do think you see a little more of it in MLS, but not a ton. There aren't a lot of guys who make it to year five, um, but he he does seem to have come back refreshed. And I don't want to say he has new ideas because at times when he was with Dallas, um, that team played beautiful soccer. But oftentimes they were super pragmatic. Just get guys behind the ball. They always had fast wingers, you know, Mm -hmm. like spray, get, you know, whether it's Castillo on one side or Barrios on the other side, get those guys into transition, run behind the defense. Um, And maybe it was a little too much of that by the end. uh, And I thought that's what we were going to see with Orlando city, but it's not They're They're building from the back. He's doubled down on guys who could pass the ball. Like I thought Ori Roussel was cooked in MLS. I just thought he wasn't going to be, uh, enough of a force multiplier with his distribution and his comfort on the ball to sort of make up for his lack of defensive range. But they found the right balance with that in central midfield. And then what we saw in this game was the trump card, which is uh, Mauricio Pereira, the the little Uruguayan number 10. Um, He he seems to be their Maxi Morales or their Nico Ladero. And in this one, they actually used him as a decoy. The previous game, they had run everything through him. He had 75 touches, most of anybody on either team. In this game, he had fewer touches, but they used him to drop back and pull Victor Wanyama out of central midfield. Uh, Get that six, unplug him from that area, and then you're able to play right through there. And Mm -hmm. they did it time and time and time again, and that's eventually what led to the goal. So it's plan B. Yes, but like if you look at the plan A that Oscar Pereja has repeatedly come up with through throughout the course of this tournament, it's it's been fun to watch. And it needs to be said, like five five years of what we saw in Orlando City, it took Oscar Pereja less than five games to get them playing like this, which needs like that. When we talk about other coaches and other teams in the league that are struggling, and we saw it last year in New England with Bruce, like you should not need two years to get things right. No, Matias Almeida, it took him a month and a half. Month and a half is all it took for that San Jose team to start playing good, you know, free flowing, pretty soccer. So hats off to to Oscar Pereja. And um, I hope Orlando City fans are, are enjoying this because there hasn't been a lot for them to enjoy during their time. But this this run, 
as with the Thomas Hassall thing, it feels special. It feels like something memorable is happening here. Charlie, one sec. Uh, I want to ask about Montreal, but I want to follow up on Doyle and just say a lot of the pieces all three of those coaches used already existed. Yep. So the my roster is not good enough excuse. Pereira obviously wasn't healthy last year. He was brought in because he was available. But so many of the pieces Orlando is using now has been there. San Jose basically didn't change anyone except for one or two players. And uh, New England brought in Gustavo Bo eventually, but still played a more improved level of soccer under mm-hmm. Bruce Arena before they did that. And that's why I've always said this. If I was a GM hiring a new head coach, I wouldn't say, which guys are you going to bring in to make the team better? I would say, how are you going to make the team better with the guys that we already have? If yeah. you show me a blueprint for that and say, I could make it work with this, and then maybe we'll talk about going out and getting a DP or a TAM defender or whatever you need. Like That's what I want to see from coaches, and that is what Oscar Bareja has done, and I'm jacked about it. <laughs> On the flip side, Charlie, Henri, he's had ups and downs, and again, it's early and it's not an ideal situation, but he's in the same situation. Uh, he kind of said after the game, it's hard to tell. We've only played five games. Uh, there's been a lot of question marks after this one of, can they attack? Are they a defensive team? He kind of fought that off and said we've scored a ton of goals in some games. It's the balance that we've had trouble with. We talked about Boyan in the last show, and he started at the false nine, and there just was never a presence in the box until he subbed off. What do you make of Montreal through this month, through the time we've seen them so far under Henri? Montreal are missing pieces and Boyan in particular has not been impressive. You you talk about a player who, who had the world in his hands at Barcelona and, and then it kind of started to, to spiral out of control. Then he ends up at Stoke. You think, you know, Oh, he's in the premier league scoring goals again, having some success. And then once they got relegated and he's looking for a new opportunity, you come to Montreal and, I think Thierry Henry, as well as the supporters and, and people around Major League Soccer, were hoping for a Boyan that resembled more of the Barcelona Boyan than than the the re- relegated Stoke City Boyan, and we just haven't seen enough. You, you maybe you saw a flash here or there, but that's about it. Uh, so when you look at this Montreal side as a whole, I love Zachary Brogiard and, and his pace and his willingness to get forward. Uh, I like what they that they brought in Louis Binks, um, the, the English center back, the young English, English center back who's looked com- comfortable at times, uh, has been sure on the, on the passing out of the back, timely tackles, uh, Orgio Cuanco up and down, not not a consistent. Samuel P- Samuel Piet, this is a player who is purely a six, purely. Yet in this system, we've seen him try to be a playmaker or try and get on the ball. So as a as a opposing team. You say, all right, let's close down all the other options. Don't let tight air get in the ball. Don't let Boyan get in the ball. Force Piet to make the game. He can't do it. So when you when you close him down, you, all of a sudden you're, you're creating turnovers or a loss of possession every single time. So that's been a big Achilles, Achilles heel for Montreal Impact. And then Wanyama's new. He's, he's a big presence in the midfield. He will tackle you. He'll make the smart play. But he's not covering a ground. He's not. He's not going box to box. He's more of a sit right in front of the the back four, and then he looks to play out of the back. But he's more of a, I'm going to break up plays, get it off my foot, and that's what you get from Victor Wanyama. And then tight air, when he's good, he's good. But how often is he? He good. So <laughs> for for Montreal Impact, there's too too many players that are inconsistent and. I think for Thierry Henry, it was, let me just get the mentality right, which is fight, 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 fight. But that only is good enough for so long. You need the quality. You need the ideas. And to bring that all together, like Matt Doyle said, you don't need two years. You don't need, like you said, you don't need a year. It's okay, a month, two months, three months. You have this long pandemic, which uh, I think for a team like Montreal Impact hurts them. But at the same time, Let's let's have a little bit more going forward. Let's have these passing patterns, and we haven't seen that from the Montreal Impact. So, a lot needs to go into this project. A lot more. Orlando City wins one zero. Insert Disney cliche there. Insert Orlando cliche. Insert Cinderella cliche. And maybe it continues. We look forward to it. Hopefully, in the next round, let's get the final game of the weekend before we get to Jonathan Mensa, NYCFC. Mm-hmm. 
a team that limped out of the group stage, limped into the group stage. Maxi Morales limped onto the field after a Tajiri Shradi injury early in this game. NYCFC with a 3-1 win. And Doyle, this is for you. Brenda Cahill tweeted at us when we said, what do you want us to talk about? Jimmy Sands, 19 exclamation points. Uh, how did you feel about an NYCFC team that everyone has questioned getting this victory over Toronto? Uh, I predicted it on the pregame show. Uh, NYCFC was not oh, as oh. was not as poor as their their results had indicated. In in round one, they got Andre Blake. In round two, Gaies for uh, for Orlando City. He was the best eleven goalkeeper for that round. Uh, and then in round three, without Maxi and without Eber, they were able to find a way, get a win, and sneak in. They had some good fortune to get to this point, but they had some bad fortune in the first couple of games and really the first couple of games of the season. I don't think that this team is clicking in the way that um, they were in the second half of last season under Dome. I, I think some things have changed, but things always change a little bit. And this is still a talented team that had 64 points last year. Um, and it doesn't shock me at all that they were able to uh, take advantage of a Toronto team that frankly is just so slow at the back and in central midfield. And once they got, once once NYCFC got that early goal, that was it. The, they, that was a game over. They dropped their defensive line all the way back into their own half. They said, okay, Omar, come on up because we're just going to hit into space behind you time and time again. And any time Toronto turned the ball over in midfield, and it didn't even have to be like a risky pass, but any time they turned the ball over, NYCFC was off like a flash into transition. This is not how they played last year, but they have smart, talented players, um, and they were able to identify the opponent's weakness and turn it into their own strength, um, and they were the much better team and deserved to advance because of it. Charlie, give me the flip side for Toronto. One of the favorites for this tournament, mm -hmm. and, I mean, in moments they gave up in this game, yeah, uh, especially on the third goal, which then Patty Mullins scored, would have made it 2-1 with a little bit of time to get after it. Uh, how much are you worried about Tor Toronto? I'm not worried. Um, they're missing Ayo Akinola, uh, who definitely makes an impact. It's a huge difference. Pozuelo at the as the false nine. I hate it. Pozuelo as the <laughs> I don't. I don't ever want. To, I don't ever want to see Pozuelo as a false nine again. Want Thank Never again. Do you want to see Patty Mullins start a knockout game, though, in MLS? I would, rather, I would rather put you up there and just say, just run a lot, David. If and, I get and... Canadian citizenship, I'm there. <laughs> I'm glad you said I would run I, to Orlando. I can't stand seeing Pozuelo up there as a false nine. Don't do it again. Yep. Um, but you talk about Ayo, Cano Ayo Akinola, who can stretch the back line, make yep. those, those well-timed runs, and then Pozuelo – being the architect that he is, being able to find those passes and, and complete them, you, you're taking away from the way they play. And let's not forget, I predicted this as well, because TFC's defending has not been up to par. It, yep. they, they've gotten lucky. Quentin Westberg has bailed them out at times, and he's, a sol he's as solid as they come. But as center backs, they've been too... Um, out of shape. They haven't, they haven't timed their tackles well. They haven't stood up the opponents. Well, for me, there was too many question marks with the two center backs for Toronto C. They haven't been sharp and it has, hasn't been pretty, but they've been able to get the job done because Michael Bradley uh, was able to get on the ball and, and have time and space and he could pick those passes. And then Pozuelo is Pozuelo. Piatti looked a little bit tired. You talk about the fatigue. I think everything, everything most players have been through up until this point, it showed with TFC. It really showed that, Man, th this climate, this weather, th these conditions um, ha have play paid a, a, a steep price and, and a toll on their fitness, and I think that's what got to them in the end. And NYCFC it, finally wins a knockout game. Yeah, it, well, to over Toronto, it, it makes a difference for them, right? This has been kind of a bogey team for them for the past few years. But to get back to the original question, James Sands was a big part of that in central <laughs> midfield for – uh, for NYCFC, and um, he dominated Michael Bradley. Like he made Michael Bradley miserable last night. It was one of the worst games that I've seen Bradley play uh, for Toronto FC. And part of the difference with NYCFC this year compared to last year is they're now having Sands as the six, and Sands is just a pure destroyer. 
right? He's almost like an old fashioned stopper because he does not try to pass the ball forwards at all. He is the most uninventive passer, but he is just a vicious tackler um, and he wins the ball and his reads are very good and his athleticism, uh, is, you know, in terms of field coverage is very good as well. So he sits there and then suddenly they're pushing uh, ring forward, right? And in the last year, it was ring back as the six and then Keaton Parks as the eight. Well, now you have Rings, who's a, Ring, who's a more defensive player and a little more mobile. So it, it, it's kind of like a safety first approach for this NYCFC team, which at this point makes me think that they're going to lean a little heavily, a little more heavily on playing in transition than they did under either of their previous two coaches. One of those previous coaches, Domi Trent, who might be up for the job in Atlanta, and Patrick Vieira, who might be as well. We'll talk about that coming up. But NYCFC defeated Toronto FC. They move on to the next round. Uh, we will not talk about RSL San Jose because that will be happening as this show comes out. Same as Seattle LAFC. So we will break down those games completely on Thursday. And we mm -hmm. will preview the teams moving into the quarterfinals. I'm picking RSL and LAFC in those two games. So if I'm right, keep this in. If I'm wrong, when the show comes out, just cut this. Chris mm -hmm. or whoever's work on that, Carlos. And then we don't have to worry about that. Either I'm sure Charlie picked the two opposite teams because we always disagree. Doyle, do you have picks real quick? Don't say why, just what? No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you my picks on this show. I'm gonna save it for the pregame show, which I believe Charlie and I are both on, right? MLS Today pregame show presented which by AT and T. Presented by AT and T, which is on 8 p.m. tonight, uh, and you can watch it on MLSsoccer.com and uh, the Twitter handle and Facebook and probably YouTube as well. Um, so yeah. And on that note, okay. let's talk about the Tuesday night games that are coming up because we've still got time to do that. And to do it, let's start with the captain of the Columbus crew who have been dominating no matter what the opponents have been so far in this competition. Her at t call to the field, the Ghanaian captain for Columbus crew, Jonathan Mensa. Thanks, Jonathan, for coming on. Uh, thank you for having me on. So... You've been a part of some of the best crew teams in history. 2017, your first year, you went to the conference finals. This is a new group under Caleb Porter. Does it feel different? Does it feel similar? Um, it feels different in, in terms of uh, the game plan, the coaches, obviously, and uh, some of the players. Um, but uh, the same uh, objective is, is uh, the objective is the same is uh, to be able to keep possession and, and do it in the um, um, opponent's half, you know, create chances and uh, get some goals. Now, Jonathan, I've, I've seen many Columbus crew teams. I've played against Columbus crew teams. But when you have Darlington Nagby and Lucas Zellerion in the midfield, how much easier is your job with those two on the field? Um, they, they're great players on the ball and of the ball. Sometimes, you know, we see most of, uh, their quality on the ball, but their movement of the ball is, is on, on another level. And, and to have these kind of players on your team, it, it, it kind of makes things look easier, but obviously we've been working on it all the time at training. So we know when they move here, we play the ball here and, and they make our job so easy. And then you're playing now alongside a young Abu Bakr Keita. Can you talk about his growth, his development, and and how you guys have, have been able to form that partnership? Um, he's, you know, most of the time we speak French because okay. he's French. And uh, he's, he's a good learner, even though, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also learning. He's, he's more of like, you tell him this, he, he show you that, yeah, I listened and I'm doing it. So it's, it's, it's good to play with him, and it's even even easier to communicate with him in French. Ale! <laughs> Jonathan, how many languages do you speak? I go three. Spanish, uh, French, and my little English that I got. <laughs> no, you, yeah, it's better got than it. ours. So I think, I think you're pretty good, and three languages is, is perfect because Charlie's French is fairly rusty. He didn't really yeah. pick it up. Yeah. And his time over there. Uh, you mentioned how easy the game can be for you. FC Cincinnati, I don't know if you know this, but you registered the second most completed passes since that stat's been recorded in MLS history as a center back. How much are you enjoying this role as, you know, with the ball at your feet consistently and those guys in front of you creating openings? Um, I think, first of all, I need to be comfortable doing it. 
um, coming into this team, you know, uh, Greg told me, you know, we are a team that, you know, want to keep possession and all that. So they've watched me several years before they brought me in and, and you know, I was also comfortable doing that. So, um, you know, as, you know, the years has gone by, I've improved and, you know, the confidence is always high, but at the same time, you have to always have uh, a little chip on your shoulder so that you know when to play and when to go along for that. So comfortable with the role that I've been given and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always willing to keep pushing for the team. Jonathan, I'm, I'm interested to know what has caused you the most problems in Major League Soccer because you're playing against a Minnesota team that really doesn't have an outright striker that's scoring goals on a consistent level. It's been kind of a rotation system. So is it a two-striker system? Is it a one-striker system? What usual, What usually is, is something that you uh, find difficult? Um, I think when, when you don't know what, what to expect, you know, because obviously sometimes when we watch films and we see what they did in previous games, we can project and, and know what they will do next. But sometimes when you don't know what they're going to throw at you, you need to be mentally, psychologically, and um, yeah, physically ready for anything they throw at us. And uh, I've been I've been doing that for for many years, so I'm going to be ready for this one too. So in that group, you lose Will Trap, who's a leader, and now you're the captain. And you mentioned Abu Kakeda, a young guy next to you. Do you relish the opportunity to be the vocal one, to be the one leading, adjusting, and making things happen? Um, talk of being vocal, I don't talk much, but I, you know, I just want to show it because, um, even though I'm with the armband, we all make sure that we always uh, play our roles. We always talk when needed and, and, uh, we do our best to help each other because I'm not the one to call small meetings and all that, but, uh, you know, I'm always out there showing what I can do to help the team. And, um, that's my job. So when you got here in 2017, I think a lot of people would say it wasn't the easiest year for you that first year. Now, four years later, you're captain of this team. Did you, how long did it take to feel comfortable here? Did you ever, from that year to now, see this coming? Um, yeah, obviously, when you keep working, the results will show. And um, I was I was working my butt off, you know, sorry for my language, but... <laughs> <laughs> I was working all the time and, you know, even though some people uh, would say, you know, my first season was, it was difficult for me, but, you know, 2016 wasn't the best year for the crew, but 17, I came in, whatever that happened with myself, the team did well, we went to the conference final. So to me, it was, it was a good season for me, but, um, you know, uh, people got their opinion. So, um, but, you know, as like I said, I've been working and, and I'm happy for, for my growth. I mean, I, I've seen you now. You're leading by example. Um, you're a captain, but you lead by example. Now you've seen the MLS for, for, you know, a couple of seasons now. What impresses you about the, the level of competition, the quality uh, since you've been a mainstay with the crew? I think uh, generally it keeps growing, which is the most important thing, Um any league in the world obviously want to grow and it's it's been uh, great to see the growth you know being part of it i feel it and um, i like the energy you know uh, expansion teams coming in doing well like atlanta they came in a couple of years ago and they've won it so um you know we can see the difference uh you know this league is showing so uh, very impressed and and very blessed to be part of this uh, league so you're going to start bringing more black stars over here See more, some more Ghanaians over here Please. in the league, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. You know, when, when they see one of the Black Stars or any other African player or any other Black player playing in the league and, and you know, doing well, they want to start talking to the players in the league, you know, how is it there? And, and when you tell them how it is, you know, they always want to uh, jump in if they get the opportunity to come play here. Asamoah could still score goals here, right? Oh yeah, for sure. If you know, a team, a team is going to look at him and bring him on board, it's going to be really nice for the for the league. You mentioned that connection, Harrison Awful in Columbus. How much has that been big for you to get comfortable? What what's your relationship like? Oh, he's um, he was actually my partial agent because you know he he was asked by Greg, "Do you know this guy?" So yeah, I play with him in the national team, and I've known Harrison for over a decade now. So. He told Greg, yeah, if you want someone that can play from the back, uh, strong, uh, fast, 
um, I think you can go for this guy. So um, he's a friend, he's a brother, and you know I, I felt even comfortable playing on the right side with him. So uh, great to have him. That guy never ages. He's thirty four. <laughs> Like he's 24. <laughs> so I think that uh, there's no way he's 34. Uh, I no. know. <laughs> I'm interested to know what you think of the black players for change, because in Europe, you know, I've, I've played in Europe and you never felt that there was, you know, all the black players are coming together to, to promote change and, and fight for each other. Major League Soccer, you fast forward to 2020, all the black players are coming together and staff to, to want more. And, I'm interested to see uh, to know what you think about all of that. I think it's uh, it's a great initiation because um, I've played in France, Spain, um, Russia, South Africa, and I never saw anything like that. Um, you know, from from uh, what I said before, the league is growing and not just growing in uh, in terms of uh, everything, but you know, uh, black players coming together for a greater cause like that. It's such an incredible thing to see, and and you know we can all um, do what we can do to to push this uh, uh, agenda forward. Obviously, some people might might take it a different way. You know, we all got our opinions, but we all know this is for the right thing. So we all gonna jump on board and and do our best for this thing. It's been awesome watching the players lead. You're gonna lead your side out against. Minnesota in this round of 16 game when you look at Minnesota specifically what's the keys for Columbus to get a victory uh, we just need to stick to our game plan uh, go out there play hard and uh, play to the whistle because obviously we know we know there's uh, VAR and uh, we don't need to stop and you know expect anything from the referee we just need to play throughout and, and uh, we will just uh, execute our game plan uh, well what are those training battles like between you and Jossie's artist. So I'm always on the same team with him, but uh, ah, okay. that's because he's captain. What about he small knows. sided? What about small sided? Yeah, that was where I was going to get to. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. I, I make sure that I put him in my pocket too. <laughs> <laughs> if, um, if he can beat me, then I'm sure he can beat any defender in the league because I'm, 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 I'm the best. So I, yeah. I will show him in training that bro, I'm the best. So if he can beat me, then you can beat anyone out there. So I always kind of push him and he pushes me as well. So it's always, you know, good to have a healthy competition in, in practice. That's a lot of, to hear. A yes. lot of the names we've talked about, everyone's been talking about with Columbus. One that hasn't gotten mentioned as much, Luis Diaz. You mentioned in training, seeing these attacking players. How good can he be for Columbus and in MLS? I think it comes down to individual uh, hunger. You know, because collectively we're always going to push him. We're always going to be there for him. But um, he needs to know when and you know where to do his stuff. And and we always you know going to back him up to to bring you know his quality on board. And we know he's fast. He got good crosses, and, and we always expect you know that from him. Well, I hope that you uh, continue to bring over more players from Ghana, yes. Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Senegal, Cameroon. Everyone is welcome in MLS. And it has been awesome to watch you the do Gambia. your thing. And the Gambia, Gambia of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Charlie, yeah, I would never. Can do that. Hey. Can do that. Yes. Hey, my father's from Gambia, so he will be nice. proud if we start <laughs> seeing some more Gambians. For sure. For sure. We hope that's the future for Columbus crew. We hope you continue on your run. Jonathan, it's been awesome to watch you guys play. It's been awesome to see the resurgence of this team and under your leadership as captain. Uh, good luck going forward, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. God bless. Thank you so much to Jonathan Mensa for taking the time to talk to us. His game against Minnesota, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday night on ESPN and TSN. That's going to be one of the really good matchups in the round of 16. And the final round of 16 game, which we will get to preview here, is the Portland Timbers against FC Cincinnati, just as everyone predicted. 10.30 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN and TSN. And one person did predict it. I put out a tweet asking what people wanted us to talk about, and Nick Tuell said, I feel like I have to root for FC Cincinnati since Doyle picked Group E spot on and everyone judged him for it. So, mm -hmm. Doyle, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, it was less about Cincinnati and more about my thoughts on the Red Bulls in Atlanta. I, I thought those teams were both dead meat going into the tournament, and so they were. Uh, FC Cincinnati has not played well, um, but they – play with five at the back now, three giant center backs, and they have been just opportunistic enough 
going forward. They have Medunian sitting in front of the center backs to spray. Um, so that gets them out in transition. And they got a couple of ball winners, so they're not as vulnerable as they were in that first game when they just got marked by the crew. Um, and against the Red Bulls, they sat in, and the Red Bulls crossed the ball 51 times. 51 times against the back line with three center backs who are all over like six foot two. Predictable. <laughs> Just a bit, right? But this is what this is what Portland did last year. So if I this is the worry for the Portland fans, right? Because this Timbers team, I think, ha- has played so much better in this tournament than we saw in the first two games back in March, and then basically all of last year when their only ideas were hope Valeri does something amazing or get it to the fullbacks and lump across towards the, the penalty area. Um, I, it, this is like Portland should win this game. They should win this game comfortably, but it's going to be a big test to see and make sure that they, they don't fall into their bad old habits of just bringing those fullbacks up and launching towards the penalty spot and hoping, you know, a Bobasi can you know rise up and win a header, or somebody you know scores on a rebound or something like that. They have too much talent to play like that. And full credit to them thus far in this tournament, they haven't played like that. So they need to show that ability to break down a low block. That is all Cincinnati is going to do is defend. They're going to do exactly what Vancouver did against Sporting KC. I mean, for me, Portland has the, the two keys to break down a low block. You give Blanco and Valeri time and space, they can shoot from distance. And when you're draw, shooting from distance, that forces Cincinnati to step up to, to close that space. And when you close that space, then you're talking about a Bobasi looking to find those holes in those gaps and then put, get played the ball to his feet. And then he, it's up to him to have that first touch, to be able to turn and shoot and create for himself. But Portland are well positioned to deal with a team that's sitting in the low block. It's just about getting Valeri and Blanco on the ball to expose Cincinnati in those areas when they're dropping eight, nine guys behind the ball. We've talked about Abobasi a lot. He scored goals, but this feels like the type of game, Doyle, as you said, this is what they struggled with last year. If mm-hmm. he can be the central piece of pulling a, a team together that bunkers, because we don't know what 2020 looks like and everything, but teams will bunker when you come to Portland. It's yep. the reality of the situation. And it's the reality of sometimes you can get Savarese's teams to fall into it. If a Bobasi shows he can be the guy to help you pick that apart, as Charlie said, he now takes a step above some DP strikers that you brought in as the starting center forward for a, a group that spent a lot of money in that position. No, you're right. Um, and I actually think that a Bobasi's been better in those possession situations. He naturally kind of wants to come back to the ball and link play a little bit. Um, and he's not you know, he's, he's not aggressive enough with his score goal scoring runs. He doesn't, he's still working on that. So I, I'm looking forward to him in this situation. Um, but like you said, there's another DP striker there. And this is, this is maybe something a little bit different than what they did last year. You could maybe throw if if since he's just putting everybody back, you could throw a Bovisi and Nishgata on yeah. together and you could just have, you know, Abobasi is the target man, and he's got to trying to to run. And when, I don't think we'll see that from the start, but I I do expect I do expect Portland to to be clever about trying to send runners through the lines off their center forward than they were last year. And in particular, this plays to Jimmy Chara's strengths. Jimmy Chara is one of the he's a very clever little winger who likes to pinch in and is able to find those gaps and get to the end line and then pull backs, pull backs, pull backs, pull backs to, you know, whether it's a Bobasi on the near post or, you know, the trailing runner, Valeri at the top of the box or Blanco cutting in from the other side. Like Charlie said, they have they have the raw materials to break down a bunker. They just need the will and the discipline to do it in a way that they didn't last year. So don't forget 1030 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN and TSN. That'll be the moment when uh, FC Cincinnati proves everything we just said wrong for the like yep. fifth time <laughs> in the last week. And then they'll move on and Kendall Lawson will still be Pura Vida and everyone will still be happy. Either way, it should be a fun one. What a great game to close out uh, the group stage on. And then going forward, Thursday starts the quarterfinals. There'll be a game on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So plenty of soccer for you, but only one game a night. So Doyle could potentially sleep or eat in between or around those, but 
once again, fingers crossed, next Monday, the Doyle went crazy show, but who knows? Uh, Thursday's the first one, SKC versus Philly, 8 p.m. Eastern time, ESPN, TSN, and Tevia. Friday night is 7.30. Orlando will play the winner of the Seattle LAFC game. Saturday night is at 10.30, NYCFC versus the winner of the Portland-Cincinnati game. And then Sunday is all of the games on Mondays, winners facing off against each other. So it's a big TBD versus TBD matchup at 8 p.m. Eastern time, which I think TBD has a chance, but who knows? TBD might play well. On the flip side, I know we talked a lot about SKC Philly. So Charlie, just give me real quick. In this matchup between the two, what's your what's your big focus? What's going to uh, win it for one side? For SKC, it's about being defensively sound and getting Johnny Russell involved, getting, go, going down the flank because it's going to be him versus Kai Wagner. And, and Kai Wagner likes to go forward, but if Johnny Russell and, and SKC can pin Philadelphia in their own half, they're going to have the advantage in this game. And then drawing Jack Elliott, and Mark McKenzie out of spaces because they will follow strikers. Now that's their problem is sometimes they get a little too um, happy and, 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 and I think aggressive to follow players out to the wings and Alan Polito can draw and drag those players out. And then they need Kyrie Shelton, Johnny Russell, uh, Kinda to come inside and make those runs because that space is going to be there for them to take. And then for Philadelphia union, you got to make sure those center backs are, are trying to make the game for Sporting Kansas City. Put pressure on them. Make them try and, and cough up the ball or try and do something uh, erratic because it's proven over time SKC has has broken down because of their center back play. So Brandon Aronson, Casper Shevilko, Sergio Santos, make those runs, drag them, take them 1v1, put pressure on them when they are in possession of the ball and, and – Finish your chances. So, correction, Saturday is a doubleheader. No game on Sunday, 8 o'clock and 10.30 p.m. on Saturday to close out the uh, quarterfinals, and then we'll have the semifinals coming up, and then the final. And if you don't know what's at stake, there's an epic sizzle video on MLS's Twitter that Charlie Davies VO'd that I watched the other day and stood up, and Megan's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm pretty jacked up right now. This was good stuff. So, Charlie, you hit me in the feels. Good work. Uh, go check that one out if you can. Let's move off the field for the thing that everyone's been talking about over the last few days. Atlanta United knocked out in the group stage of the MLS's back tournament, did not score a goal. And then Frank DeBoer and the club mutually parted ways mm -hmm. uh, right after getting back to Atlanta. Stephen Glass, the Atlanta 2 coach, will be named interim coach, but you'd expect Atlanta United to maybe bring a bigger name coming forward so far they've hired a former argentine manager and barcelona manager and then a famous dutch international who managed in Serie A, the premier league and era divise doyle looking back on fdb what went wrong and what direction do you see them going in i, I think what went wrong is that he um it he's just such a conservative soccer coach he people when they've talked about changing the culture, they focused on nationalities and parts of the world. And I'm not sure that really matters. Um, I think players just want to play for good, smart coaches who can relate to them and who uh, players want to play fun soccer. You know, we all like watching Manchester city. We, we all like watching Bayern Munich because they play good soccer. Um, and I think that DeBoer didn't want to play that. He, he wanted to to be very methodical and slow and, you know, this you know position here and you don't go forward. To, and it, so it went wrong right from the start. And you could see it in um, the players' demeanors. Um, I'm a big body language guy, and it was, it was very obvious uh, pretty early on that the players didn't like playing in that. And last year, I've said this a million times, and Atlanta fans didn't want to hear it, Last year, what Joseph Martinez did was remarkable because early May, that team was falling apart. That team was playing like they had n no intention of competing for anything. And Joseph picked them up and put him on his shoulders and carried them for months. He scored something like 17 out of 18 games from mid-May to mid-September, including the U.S. Open Cup final, including – I mean, he – 
he 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 was more valuable in 2019 than he actually was in 2018 <laughs> when he won the MVP of the league, the All Star Game, and MLS Cup. So what he did was remarkable, but it was. I don't want to say it was a one-man show because Nagby had his moments. Gonzalez Perez had his moments. Gressel had his moments. But oh, it was a Band-Aid? The, it was a Band-Aid. Yeah, it covered yeah. up. And then they got rid of all those guys. And then Joseph got hurt. And what are you doing? What are you, You're just destroying what was the most fun team in the entire league in 2017 and 2018. And they played this just slow and dour soccer. So you have that. And then the other thing Frank DeBoer was brought in to do – was to turn Ezekiel Barco into an eight-figure transfer out and to turn George Bello into the best young left back in the league and to turn Miles Robinson into the best young center back in the league. And you can't go one for three. You can't go one for three when that's your job. And then on top of that, you got the South American Player of the Year in P.T. Martinez, and he has been a below-average MLS attacker. Mm. But it's like – like you, you check so many boxes at that point. You, you've you've written your own resignation letter at that. You just have. Well, so how much of this falls on the hot, just the idea, and of hiring Frank DeBoer? You have to know what you're getting, and I think from his history, it, it goes into okay. Does he play exciting, attractive football, or is this going to be boring? Tiki Taka or wannabe Tiki Taka, old school Barcelona, slow here, 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 and then shoot like a robotic almost. That's not Atlanta United. That's not what the fans want from Atlanta United. And it showed because even though they did have success, it wasn't like, oh, this is thrilling. And Mickey Almiron is running circles around people. And then he, he, he lays a ball for a tap in for Joseph Martinez and you hear all the horns blowing and everyone's that's not, that's not the Atlanta United we saw. And Nagby as well as Joseph Martinez was able to bail Atlanta out because of his ability to get out of tight spaces and, and be getting the ball in, in horrible spots surrounded by three or four people and still find the right pass or make the right decision. You lose him. Nope. That's not happening anymore. It, now it's coming right back down your throats. And so you look at who who can they go uh, from – where can they go from here? Who, who are the options? You so, need one with a big personality who is going to play attacking football and look to threaten teams. And it's all – it's got to be exciting. That, that's what Elaine and I – needs to be exhilarating. And if you don't have that, don't even, don't even entertain that person. So I just think we should mention because – you talked about the mistakes in hiring DeBoer. Um, you know, he leaves the club. Mm-hmm. And what Atlanta United built has built is incredible. But Carlos Bocanegra and Darren Eels are the ones who brought in DeBoer. And they're the ones who have helped turn this roster over since Tata Martino has left. Um, whether it was forced with Almiron, he was always going to go. You had no choice. And you had to try and replace a special player, which you won't always hit on. And then some felt less forced in LGP. The way they handled Julian Gressel. The way they've handled... Nagby, it felt like there Tito Viaba. It felt like there was maybe some issues with the way, and you talked about culture, the way the club was internally, and they let these players go. Mm-hmm. Now it's going to be their job, though, to get the next coach. Do you think it'll be international, or do you think it'll be someone with MLS experience? Donald, to your point of culture is about soccer ideas. Does it matter? Uh, and are there any names that stick out? I think it's international, 100%. Uh, I think it's international because that's kind of the way they've gone with Tata Martino first. Then they followed up with Frank DeBoer. They want names, names, names. They want recognition. So you talk about on the global level, who are some of those people that are out there? Now, you're swinging for the fences. You're going for it all. You're going for the Grand Slam. You're going for Pochettino. Is is he interested in Atlanta United? I would think Actually, not. Actually, YouTube <laughs> headline, Mauricio Pochettino, <laughs> headed to Atlanta. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, I don't see foresee that whatsoever uh but a guy that would make sense that has had success that inter miami tried to get is patrick cliver that's a player who uh a coach who who had success as a player who had the the transition of working his way up with manchester city and then got his his shot with new york city played fantastic Patrick 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 had played fantastic football and then left to go to nice and has been competitive in, in league Liga. So for me, 
you go, you try and make that happen. You try and bring him back. Now, other players like Patrick Cliver uh, at Barcelona, who has been rumored to to be a front runner for for the manager job, the front for the first team. That's also intriguing. Um, but I think what what's really important is something that the Black Players Coalition brought up, uh, Black Players for Change brought up, and that is when you look at the first list, a short list for this coaching job, there was not one black coach on that list. Now I went back and forth um, thinking about the list and it's not that you just put on a black, black coach just because to have a black coach on it, but it's more of a deeper issue that we're not grooming any black coaches and no black coaches are having the opportunity to become that front list, uh, the front runner on that short list. And when I look at players uh, who have had tremendous careers that haven't maybe had the opportunity to become a coach or become a great coach, uh, I look at these names, Kobe Jones, who I've spoke to personally, um, the all-time Caps leader for U.S. men's national team, one of the all-time greats, has never had a proper coaching opportunity to become an all-time great. Um, Robin Frazier, who is now with Colorado Rapids, that's one guy who's who's made the most of his opportunities. Uh, but then you look at Eddie Pope. Where's his opportunity? This is one of the probably the greatest U.S. men's national team center back of all time. Tony Sane, who I just had a conversation with last week. World Cups, MLS Cups, Champions League, nothing. Minnesota United, not even a thing. Not nothing. And this is one of the all-time greats. Uh, as far as be, being a, a right back in the U.S. Men's National Team, right back who's made so much with his with his um, opportunities, hasn't even been connected to Minnesota United. Um, Carlos Yamosa, another player who's who's just been on the outskirts as an assistant coach, brought along Jeff Cunningham, one of the all-time great strikers in this league, no opportunities. Most recently, Demarcus Beasley. You talk about World Cups, Champions League. MLS, Houston doesn't even offer him a position, whether it's an assistant for Tab Ramos or in the front office. It was always, ah, we don't know. Uh, We wish him the best. Huh? Tim Howard, where where was, where's a position for him? But then you look at players who have had a smooth transition. I look at the 94 World Cup roster. McBride, U.S. general manager, great guy. And and I, I love Brian McBride, what he's done. Smooth transition. Burhalter, Friedel, Tab, Claudio Reyna, go to 98, Jason Kreiss, Precky, Ben Olsen, Vanny, 02, Josh Wolf, who's now at Austin, head coach, Boca Negra, Chris Armas, Ante Razoff, who's now looking at uh, MLS jobs, being an assistant with Bob Riley. Uh, the only, only player is Ernie Stewart. Has that has had a success in in uh, well now as a front office, but he started in Holland to get his his career yeah. going. That is the that is the problem. Black players are not getting an opportunity to make that transition to make that jump because for me these players all have the necessary experience as a player and have played in Europe, have played at the highest competition, the highest level, but they haven't been granted that that initial breakthrough role to allow them to be the next great manager for the U S men's national team or the next great manager in, in major league soccer. And so that's the problem. You can't, you look at Atlanta United, they're not going to hire anyone that's not, non not deserving of it. You have to have that massive record, that big name, but for those black players who want to be coaches or former black players, they're not being put in that position to get there, to be on that list. So that's, that's the problem. That's the initial, uh, I think for me, it's that's why Atlanta United on that initial shortlist, there wasn't a, a black name that jumped out uh, because no one's been put in that position to get there. And it's not just Atlanta United. They're just the first team to have an opening since the black players for a change have come about. And this is the point of it to force these conversations, to have them out in the open and to try and change this because we said it on this show, Charlie Joseph, legendary player in this league, coached a full international team and did it well and had a style to it, and he gets an opportunity, which is great with the Revs in the academy, but you have guys rolling off the field who are getting full head coaching jobs, 
sometimes as interims, at least as assistants, as you mentioned, all of this group of people. And you've got a guy who's one of the greatest players in this league's history, has had coaching experience and can't get an opportunity. And as you said, you need to build that resume to get on a list for an opportunity like this for Atlanta United. But Goss, that, that's the problem. That's what infuri- infuriates me on the inside is that you have a player like Shaori Joseph with everything he's done, he has coached internationally, and you have to break through at the under-15 level. Yeah. But you have other players who retire and transition right to first assistant or second assistant, and then two years down the road, they're offered a head coaching position. That's the problem. That's the big issue. So when I see what Black Players for Change are doing, it's just highlighting that, making sure people are aware of that because that should not happen. Because you, you also have players who retire and all of a sudden they're head coaches. And you're like, huh? How that, where, where did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Pablo but, Mastrini stepped off the field and coached. And two, even just Jay a little Heath, bit more. Austin, and, you know, right. Guys who played with Shalri. Right. Shal- was more central to the team. Got those opportunities. Not that they don't deserve it, but Shalri does as well. And many right. more guys do. Uh, before we close this out, and uh, we'll continue to talk about this, as we've said over the last few months. We will continue to talk about these issues in Major League Soccer and in society. So I just wanted to ask, we didn't hear any South American names yet, and that's where a lot of the talent has come from, mm. and that's where Tata Martino came from. Is there anyone stand out? Maybe a guy who's coached PT Martinez in the past and gotten the best out of him. Uh, just, you know, just throw throwing that around. Out. Maybe not. Maybe hey. other guys. Is there anyone that stands out to you that could be in the running? Uh, because they went down to Argentina and interviewed Tata there and worked there, and they planned it, you know, in Argentina and brought him up. Yeah, I, I I will go back to Charlie's original point and say the guy who makes the most sense is Patrick Vieira. But getting a, a, a coach out of a top five league is such a giant he, – like, he's he's still the manager at Nice. So this would be – it would be a huge get for uh, for Atlanta United. Um, the other NYCFC – Dome is oh, – yeah. is, out of a job right now. I don't know if Dome is like, he's, chilling. He's rumored to be uh, at the top of the list for Flamengo, which is one of the, the giant clubs in, in Brazil. But he would make a lot of a, sen- a lot of sense to at least pick up a phone and call. Uh, but your reference in terms of getting the best out of PT Martinez would be uh, Marcelo Gallardo, the head coach at River Plate. Uh, he is a very, very good head coach. He is a very, very good manager. Um, I think he's angling for either a job in Europe or the Argentina job. I don't think... I don't think he's going to come to MLS, but you certainly make a call. Uh, Gabriel Hintze is, you know, one of the names that we saw on the list that Charlie was talking about. Uh, and he is, I believe, out of a job right now. He just left Dallas Um Very, very interesting style of play for them. And I think that one one that could um, translate in MLS. But I, I, I'm going to get back to my own original point. I don't think it matters as much where they're from. I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't matter at all, um, but like... Well, one of the things with DeBoer was they wanted someone who spoke Spanish at least. Yeah. Who could but at I, least bridge I, that gap. And I am fine with having that as like a prerequisite. Mm-hmm. You, have to, you have to speak English and you have to speak Spanish at least well enough to, con, you know, to, to do what Tata did in the locker room and, and keep it knit together. Um, and Dome know, did in And in Dome did, yeah. And like, um, you know tip of the cap to Michael Parker for doing and Brad Guzan for doing that as well. Um, but I like, I think that the, the first, the first thing you have to look at if you're Atlanta is, are they going to play the style of soccer that, that we want? And just because the guy's Argentinian or Chilean or what Brazilian doesn't mean that it's going to be, and we're seeing it in, in LA with Guillermo Barrascoloto. Like that is the most regressive sort of, English championship or league one style of soccer in the league right now. So, you know, make it a a comprehensive search, bear style of play in mind, bear culture in mind and bear everything that Charlie said about opportunities for black players and black coaches in mind, because it's something that we've been falling short on as a league for, for years and years. And, um, you know, people are working hard both in the league HQ and in the black players for change to try to change it. And Atlanta has been a really forward thinking um, organization in a lot of ways, given that they are the black capital of America, it would be great to see them be really forward thinking in this way as well. I know, I know a Gucci on was free. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> hey. no, he's got a podcast, Charlie. He can't <laughs> drop that. Podcasting is the peak. All I know then is- coaching, then playing. <laughs> 
Demarcus Beasley and Gucci Anyebu are ready to go. They're, they're <laughs> talk about black players in this country that have done it on every level, and who are are willing to you know learn, sit, learn, talk because for most of these jobs, it's about player experience. What you did as a player, what you learned, what you saw, and you're talking about players who played in Europe, who had success, Champions League, national team, international football. That is what you can't teach. You can't you can't learn that. What you can teach someone like them is how to how to conduct yourself in in the office and how to you know make transition transactions and and how to deal with the budgets and learning those things are teachable. But you can't teach the player experience and the interactions and being able to a Gucci and who can speak five six different languages fluent. You can't. <laughs> You can't you can't teach that and how to interact and how certain demographics react differently to certain things and how you can you know reach someone from Brazil how can how can you reach someone from from Italy or Spain you can't teach that so for me if I'm building a an organization I want the best person for the job who, who makes who, who a player a person that makes sense and a player of of that caliber would make sense that's all I'm gonna say Pretty good center back partnership with Boca Negra too. So you'd probably win most of your staff games <laughs> at that point. Atlanta United, a ton of questions right now. And they have a little bit of time to figure it out. We think they have an interim for 2020. We don't expect to see Joseph Martinez in 2020, although Joseph's ready to go probably tomorrow with his work ethic. Uh, but it probably gives them a little bit of breathing room to figure this out. It's going to be fascinating to watch. This club has built themselves in this way. They expect pressure. They've created pressure because they've performed at such a high level in their short time as a club. So that'll be fun to watch what goes down in Atlanta. And of course, everything on the field in Orlando, you've got two more games, Monday night, two more games, Tuesday night to close out the round of 16, the quarterfinal starting on Thursday night at 8 PM Eastern time, a game on Friday and a double header on Saturday to get us through to the semifinals. You can watch Charlie and Doyle before and after all of those games on MLSsoccer.com and on Twitter. And we will be back on Thursday to preview your quarterfinals, quarterfinals. And on that note, <laughs> the Thomas Assault Show has completed. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.